Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Tokyo Fintech Podcast. We welcome to the Shaul Davi, who is the head of growth at Railsbank, and he's building an invisibility cloak for finance. And that sounds very much like Harry Potter and King's Cross platform nine and three quarters, right? Um, what does that mean? What are you doing at Railsbank? Thank you, Norbert, for that introduction, and, and thank you for inviting me to uh, the chat at the Tokyo Fintech Podcast. So, Railsbank is a banking and technology platform, and we enable any company to be a fintech. We're four years old, got a, about 100 clients and 100 employees at the moment, and we're live in, with customers in UK, Europe, Singapore, uh, and now in the US. And what we essentially do is connect our customers to the global financial infrastructure. So we worry about the licensing, the operations, issuing accounts, issuing cards, sending and receiving money, um, and all the basics of the financial infrastructure for our clients. So they need to only worry about their customers and the use case that they're developing. We take care of everything else. And we expose all that infrastructure through a single API, which means our customers can quickly conceptualize and launch any use case and then scale it with that single integration point with us in any country that we're in. And so in that conceptual diagram that we're building, the ultimately banking licenses, those are your partners. It's not Rails Bank itself, or that depends. We're not a bank, and we don't hold a banking license anywhere. But there are certain things that you can do. It's actually quite a lot that you can do without having a full deposit taking license. Uh, in the UK, for example, we're directly clearing with the Bank of England, and we're direct participants with UK Faster Payments. We're going to have direct access to European SEPA. So, in essence, in those uh, for those what we call rails payment rails, we don't necessarily need a banking partner in that value chain. But for other things in the US and elsewhere, we're very happy to partner with, with local banks. The concept of e-money uh, doesn't exist or there's some other regulatory hurdles for us. You know, the point is that we're trying to abstract all that complexity from our customers and whether it's our own license or a partner license should mean nothing to the customers. It's completely uh, transparent to them other than on the contracts where those licenses appear. I should probably clear the question around the invisibility cloak though. So we, we believe that distribution is moving away from the banks to brands and tech companies or any other companies that understand the customer better than banks. We think that customers are engaging with those companies a lot more and much deeper engagement than they are with banks. So we're providing that mechanism to open those distribution channels for the banks and for us through our customers. So would you then target more non-financial customers? Customers that want to include financial services functionality and products? Exactly. So our customers are obviously fintechs who understand the value proposition very clearly. And the speed of integration into one point is very critical for them, especially at the early stage when, when uh, funding is a little tighter. But we also have customers that have, you know, that are non-fintech and non-financial services, a supermarket in the UK, retailers of all shapes and, and sizes, and they want to introduce a financial product into their existing mix in order to you know, increase engagement with customers, control more of the transaction lifecycle, have a more sticky client base because customers don't have to go anywhere in order to complete a transaction. And always any payment related or account related product is a window to a little bit more data that may or may not have. So in terms of the data and the obvious privacy concerns or question that comes up, then who owns the data on your platform? Our customers have access to their data. We or our banking partner as a provider of a regulated service, that's payments or accounts or whatever it is, have the same obligation as uh, for data privacy as any financial institution would have. We have access to that. We hold that. We make sure that it's all complied with the GDPR, a local data residency, and the rest of it because we are regulated. The interesting part in your history is that your founder previously created Currency Cloud, which is the, the, the one fintech that everybody uses and nobody knows about. This is the infrastructure behind Revolut, Monzo, Starling Bank. So after kicking off Rails Bank, then he exited Currency Cloud and went over to create Rails Bank. 
is that one evolution further where currency cloud is just CFX transfer, let's say, and Rails Bank is more product rich? I think that's pretty accurate. The concept of abstracting an infrastructure to the customers is very similar. The concept of changing unit economics of that because you abstract and aggregate is also quite similar. The FX world is very, very, very complex. From that perspective, we have no interest in doing what Currency Cloud are doing. They are one of our suppliers for that. So in our concept, there are things that we will do ourselves, but there's a lot of those services that we just enclose in under our single API, but the actual service is performed by partner. And FX is a good example. Obviously, on the compliance side and, and onboarding, there are people that do onboarding a lot better than us. They're experts in that and understanding and, and verifying documents. We create a menu, a modular menu of all those services on their on their Rails Bank, but we're not going to do that ourselves. Investment services, insurance, all those verticals or sub-verticals of financial services will be supplied by partners of ours and exposed to our customers via the same route. And we're talking about the single API, but in reality, there's multiple, right? So I think Currency Cloud said they have 85. So there's for the different products or activities, transactions that are being executed there's a well-documented website that one can register and see all the functionality that Rails Bank provides. Yeah, that's all open on our website with a simple registry. We're, we're a product company, primarily for product builders and product owners. We, we pride ourselves on the simplicity of those APIs and the proof is in the pudding. So we're putting that out there. So far, the feedback we're getting from customers and other people who've tried it, that they are simple. There are many endpoints to the API and our goal is to simplify that and make sure that we can do all the data transitions from one standard to another across countries or across providers. And there's one message that comes from our customers and we can transform that to the right endpoint in the right manner. And it looks very simple, right? And there were three environments. One is a complete play environment. Yep. The other was limited production with very low thresholds on transaction or total transaction volume. And then obviously the real production. Anybody can go on there and and try and experiment with your services within an hour. On the Play Live too, actually. That doesn't require onboarding. It is obviously, for that reason, very limited in the amount of money that you can move, but they're moving real money currently in GBP only. We'll open that shortly for other uh, currencies, but you can really play, really see money moving from your account to somewhere else, and, and we prove how easy it is to do. The one thing I struggled with a bit was, I think you, the website said you're supporting FX between the G10 currencies Currencies. I and mean, on the other side, I only have GBP or and euro accounts. How do I transfer money from GBP into Japanese yen, for example? The difference is the type of currencies that you can hold balances in as a wallet versus where you can transfer money to. So currently our live ledgers, as we call them, are in euro, in GBP, in Singapore dollars, and very, very, very shortly US dollars. So that's baseline account functionality. Those accounts are addressable by local payment schemes and international payment schemes, be it SWIFT or otherwise. So you can receive money from almost anywhere. SWIFT is, for example. And you can send money either via SWIFT or Currency Cloud or a couple of others to any banks that those suppliers are connected to. Just separating the account functionality and the send or receive money functionality, which is in, currently we have like definitely the main 26 currencies currencies that uh, Swift supports. Got it. Thank you. So you mentioned also the ledgers can support currencies, but it can technically support any digital asset and reward points or the other example for anybody who loves the blockchain crypto space. It's like if you can hold reward points on it and I can also have a ledger for my crypto on it. Is that an area you've been staying away from potentially or is it somewhere part of the roadmap? No, no we haven't stayed from any area intentionally other than the obvious gambling and, and other areas that uh, our banking part 
partners don't like and, and some of them we don't like as well. But a main innovation within the platform that we've built is a separation, the logical separation between a ledger, which is a mechanism to record transactions and balances, and the address of that ledger, which is how that ledger is exposed to the world. And traditionally in banking, those ledgers and accounts have a one-to-one relationship with an address, which is an IBAN, and that is it. And therefore, that and, and the IBAN is connected to a BIC, which is connected to a local currency. And therefore, that ledger, the same, that infrastructure can only deal with a single currency. But if you separate that and say, I can have an account that has multiple addresses, that each address relates to a different, uh, what we call rail, then there are different ways to to find that ledger and create transactions on it. So a same ledger can have an IBAN, the same ledger can have a mobile number as, as a wallet, it can have any other logical number for a different rail. For example, we have a, a client called Tally, and basically, the Tally account is a gold account. So you load it with GBP. It's immediately transferred into the equivalent amount uh, of gold. And then that ledger holds actually your gold balance, not a GBP balance, but with a mechanism to convert that gold balance to any currency at real time. So when you spend it in the real world, you spend in GBP that's automatically at a real time transferred to a gold value that is then debited from your account if you have that balance, obviously, through the authorization. So that account, whilst the values there are uh, representing gold grams or ounces or whatever it is, at the same time, you're represented in multiple ways through reward points, if we know what the FX mechanism there or any other currency or digital currency or points. So that separation is what makes the ledger so versatile. And a few episodes ago, we had Michael Laughlin from Token on the show as well. Mm-hmm. How are you different from what Token provides, for example? Well, actually, very, very different. They operate on a data layer. So it's kind of more of a horizontal sharing of information and payment information between different providers where we're opening up the infrastructure layer. So think of it as a vertical versus a horizontal between different different providers. So I think Token could be potentially one of our partners in the same way that TrueLayer Plaid could uh, enhance the offering and access to uh, open banking and the rest of it. So they would be using the open banking functionality and regulation to do like a payment initiation, but call the bank's API with that payment initiation request, and then the bank would execute it while you can execute it yourself directly, as you explained at the beginning, because you're part of faster payment, etc. So it goes much deeper in the stack. Exactly. It's much deeper in the stack and it, it, uh, across jurisdictions. You know, token would be, TrueLayer and, and, and Plaid would be, an additional service for our customers. So our customers will have the use case to pull data from other banks uh, that are not Rails Bank to enhance their service to the customers. So it's about accessing data that we don't have on our platform and initiating payments into uh, providers that are that are not us. But we want to integrate that into our single integration point and have those additional services available for our customers. Is there this network effect on your platform where if MMA consumer goods company that has millions of clients, let's say in Nike and selling all these sneakers, because there's a high penetration and people using my app, the transfers that are happening don't necessarily need to go external, right? They can happen as yeah. ledger entries on your platform. And does that make a difference in the charging model or how attractive it could be for your customers and then ultimately for your customers' customers who are the end users? Of course. And that international footprint would think is going to be very attractive to those global brands or fintechs that are growing globally because every single new market in the past, you had to build the same infrastructure um, again and again and again, which is costly, costly to maintain, more uh, license costs, more engineering resources. And then you have to make that investment before you actually sold anything in the market um, and got any feedback from 
from real customers. We're taking all of that investment requirement away. So if you think of um, you know Revolut and TransferWise coming to Japan over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, they have both built a similar tax tag to be able to provide their services, which is an account and then an FX transaction. Whereas the infrastructure itself doesn't provide any of them with any strategic advantage over each other on, on the FX. They're competing not on access to the Japanese payment scheme, but on service and price and a host of other factors, but not the connectivity. So we think that connectivity could be us. And obviously they went into Japan before us, but it could have used, for example, our infrastructure and be in the market a lot quicker. All right. So now we're hitting Asia. You mentioned Singapore. So what's your overall plan for Asia and your perspective that you had from your prior experience also promoting British trade in the region? Asia is a very, very obviously very, very different market growing higher than, than other regions around the world. The main challenge in Asia is that it's a highly fragmented market. And whereas we see people moving around and workers and, and other companies that are becoming big regional players, like Grab and a host of others, the infrastructure itself and the regulatory framework is highly fragmented. And therefore, the cost of expansion across borders in Asia is really, really inhibiting. And at the same time, I think that there's a lot of local domestic fintech companies that have reached the maturity level and size to start thinking, right, I've nailed Singapore. How do I operate in Indonesia? How do I operate in Philippines? Our first client in Singapore, SingLife, is ex exactly at that stage. So we're working with them in other markets. We've, we've launched in, in Singapore and we're working with them in other markets where again, together we enter the market, the platform is ours. So from their perspective as a customer, they see the same, same capabilities and they're able to build a very similar user experience in different markets. Before that, again, they would have had to build their own stack in each and every market. Looking at Japan, I think that the biggest inhibitor beyond the cultural aspects is one barrier that I would very much be interested in removing, that access to the infrastructure, the payments or the bank account or uh, whatever it is. And that would drive foreign fintechs into Japan. But more crucially, it'll give the impetus to Japanese entrepreneurs a way to get out uh, and explore the rest of the region. Railsbank is behind the Sing Live debit card? That's right. Oh, it's coming together yeah. now. Excellent. Yeah, we're very, very, very proud of that. That was quite, a, quite an impactful announcement when that came out. An insurance player becoming a more general financial services provider. In their words, in, in, in Walter's, the CEO, in his words, this is about blurring the lines between the various financial subsectors. And they have a really, really good product and a really good vision of where they want to go in, in terms of you know their insurance products and their investment products and, and the managed product that uh, sits uh, on top of that. We're very, very excited that they are a customers and they're also our investors. That's a fantastic showcase. Come back to Japan. I think we're, we're sitting here tonight because we were debating over Twitter the announcement that banks can now invest more aggressively into fintech companies and just need to file with the FSA rather than seeking approval if they exceed 15%. That supports the big banks for me is just a further entrenchment of the mega bank structure. And clearly what would benefit the consumer is what you've just described earlier, saying lowering the barriers for entrepreneurs to offer innovative financial services. And that's for me what's lacking in the dominant position of the three banks. I agree. But I, th I think we also have to think about what is the small steps that a, an ecosystem needs in order to sustain itself in the long term. And the lack of foreign VC in Japan is sort of one of them. How do you convince that, convince a US or a UK or, or a Singapore-based VC that a Japanese entrepreneur can really build a big business if they're stopped at the, at, at the first hurdle? So I think allowing those banks to invest in some of those, especially on the consumer front end, would enable more ideas to come to market and build that experience, that entrepreneurial uh, hustle experience for more Japanese entrepreneurs and will show the world or prove to the world that can build a big business in, in, in Japan.
So that's sort of one aspect of it. The other aspect is, again, I think the banks are not interested in competing with each other, but they very much understand that they need to up their game for their customers. Them being able to invest in some of those front-end products that may have a different brand on it is the next step to encourage non-banks to say, well, okay, so that's the art of the possible. That's what the fintechs can do. Why can we do the same? With the support of the banks, with or without the investment of the banks, but it's it's, it's going to showcase first steps in, in the vision that I described previously, which is uh, the distribution is actually moving elsewhere. I think there are people in the banks that get that, or maybe maybe not all of them, but it's a, it's a first step to creating a new distribution channel. And then obviously we want to play in that in that market. Price of two things that's going to zero. And one is stock trading versus like all these zero fee providers coming up. And the other one is ultimately payments because mm-hmm. of products and platforms like Reels Bank that make it almost mandatory for any app, no matter which industry, to provide payments payments. And clearly, these will not be substantially paid for by the consumer. It will just be table stakes. It will be expected that these are there. And because we're living in a fairly old payments infrastructure in Japan, there's still high cost of individual transaction. Plus, compared to Scandinavian countries, Sweden, it's more like a monthly account fee. And then you get unlimited money transfers, bank transfers included. While in Japan, the account typically is free. You don't pay monthly fee, but every time you transfer money, the cost is relatively high. That's sort of the old model of bundles um, in the banks. Nothing is free. You pay for it somewhere else. You just don't know it because it's not clear. But, but, but I agree. So se- separating that functionality, operating at a much lower margin in the UK, because we don't have, we're, we're not a bank, we don't have to support a large branch network, yet we're sitting on top of faster payments and we get the same sort of fees. There's a system to be uh, maintained. So there's a fee. But we see the same cost structure as any of the other banks. And our margin is a lot smaller than banks' margin. So we're separating that cost from the rest of the services that you may or may not get from your bank, making it a lot clearer for our customers what they're paying for, you know, modularizing those cost structures and not having to subsidize anything else means that you can build consumer use cases that make sense, that are clear, not opaque in terms of in terms of hidden costs, clear and provide real value. From a non-bank retailer or platform to operate banking service, whether that's payments or accounts, or wallets or, or whatever, they can then decide whether there's a, a good enough business reasons for them to offer that free because they're making the margin somewhere else or not, but they don't have to put the investments in. With that in mind, what will be your market approach broadly for Japan? I think initially, I would imagine to have quite a bit of interest from non-Japanese providers that want to go into Japan, uh, removing the complexities and moving it from the uh, to difficult bucket to, hey, we can actually do it, like go to market, test it quickly, scale if we need to. I'm a strong believer in the opportunities in Japan, and I think other companies see that um, and just looking for the easy way in. At the same time, it's going to be a bit longer talking to a number of larger non-bank players in Japan about offering those additional banking services to their existing customer base. At the moment, I'm looking for the right partner, partner bank. We want to work with one of them. Who's the right one? Who's going to move quickly with us and, and see the opportunity in the same way that we do? And then we go to market together. And so beyond Japan having now already put a flag down in Singapore, the rest of Asia, what are the next priorities? So we currently focus Philippines, Indonesia, and Australia. Again, a rel- relatively easier to go and, and a very lively fintech ecosystem there. It's a massive fundraising announcement coming in the last uh, month or so. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in Australia, um, a market that is smaller but but similar in, in, in many sense in the UK. Yeah, so these three markets are sort of phase one right now. We are absolutely 100% driven by our customers. If demand pushes us in, in another country direction, we'll go there. The next phase would like it to be Thailand, Vietnam, and Japan. 
Philippines is heavily underbanked, as I understand it. Only like 20, 25% of the population actually has a bank account, which on the one side might make it attractive, maybe on the other side more difficult because there isn't really any infrastructure to tap into. No, that means that we'll have to integrate with multiple payment schemes. So the, the, the bank-to-bank payment scheme that in most countries captures you know, 95% of uh, 90 or 95% of accounts, that doesn't apply to the Philippines. So there are all sorts of mobile or cash-based payment schemes and collections and bill pay. We're, we're assessing all of these right now. It's another rail for us. If the API calls or there's a way to integrate transactions uh, relatively straightforward, then, then we'll do that. Southeast Asia will become a huge battleground for financial players and non-financial players wanting to get into this. Right? Because you've got all the now relatively mature companies coming from the US and Europe. You've got then Alipay, WeChat Pay coming. You've got Grab Pay playing a significant role in the region. And yeah. everybody's concentrating. It's certainly not a market without competition. So there's little competition, relatively speaking, for banking as a service. There's, there's a couple of players that are going to be merging, but they're mostly domestic. So we still have some advantage in, in, in our global perspective, and especially when it comes to cross-border. We've, we've done it a number of times, so we, we, we know how to do that. The, the competition between non-banks and banks is our opportunity, really. And I think this is, from the banks, the wrong way to look at it is as competitors. Um, and the right way to look at it is as distribution, as a way to acquire wire deposits, run all the way through to a bank's funding decisions at, at, at the very top level, how you acquire deposits and how do you distribute credit. Banks can go back to that old business model, the one that works, forget all the bells and whistles around that because they will not be able to compete with Grab. Grab understands customers better than any bank has ever understood a customer ever in the history. Instead of competing with Grab, give Grab what they need so they don't have to become a bank because they don't, they have no reason to. This old mindset coming back to Japan is what you see with the open banking implementation because with PSD2 has this factor in there where you can get some free API calls. The Japanese regulation doesn't have it. And so the banks and the fintechs were left to their own devices and figuring out what the commercials are. And of course, that's not leading anywhere. And the banks still see that as a competition. So we don't want to open up, right? You're taking business away from us. And if anything, once that mind shift shifts here, then I think we'll get to that big opportunity that we're both seeing for sure. I think that's sort of, you know, the big the big shackles on open banking. It was originally, when it started in the UK, it was as a response to the banks uh, control a, a large chunk of the market. But actually, open banking is very much an opportunity for the banks. But the initial conversations were about this, this is going to break your hold on, on the market. So they naturally resisted and put a lot of effort to delay that without thinking too much about what they can do with it. That's changing. That is proven in the UK. So open banking has not made a dent bank's share of the market. I don't expect it to make an impact anywhere on that particular factor. So now the onus is on the banks to say, right, this is this is coming anyway. How do we make it work to our advantage? We're in a good position to explain that and, and, and show that and, and work together to achieve those benefits. Any company can now become a fintech. Financial inclusion is very much on the agenda. Digital assets are here to stay. We think of balance sheets as an albatross. They're big and they're very difficult to start moving and they need a lot of attention, but they can move in speed once once they're in the air. They don't need a lot of energy to continue flying. But all those trends open up a $3 trillion market for fintechs and non-fintechs. And we want to help banks capture some of that market on one hand and on the other side, help the non-banks and fintechs capture that market from a consumer perspective. They can work together. Our perfect closing statements. You're planning your fintech business. The APIs are available on the RealSpring website. You can just go and try it out. And otherwise, give show a call. Onboarding one fintech after the other, hopefully, for the rest of the year. Thank you very much yeah. for the conversation. Yeah. Thank day. you very much, Norbert. I've enjoyed it very much.